The eyes, lupine eyes, eyes that were able to bore into the centre of your soul. Rasputin was able to do something which physically altered people. We see again and again that he exercised this curious influence over the royal family, or rather over the Tsarina. He felt that he was being taken over by a higher force. The devil was somebody he was wrestling with inside his own mind, but found that it was overwhelming, that it was just too much. Grigory Rasputin was born here in Siberia, 10th of January, 1869. Its four and a half million square miles make it one of the largest and most remote pieces of land in the world. For generations, Russians had been using it as a dumping ground for all kinds of religious exiles and prisoners. It was home to holy men, healers, and secret religious sects. The first thing you need to think about with Siberia is this emptiness, this vast, isolated sort of space where there are very few people. Russians always viewed it as this kind of empty space that was there for them to fill up. They could never fill it. It was just too vast. They weren't very useful routes for traveling around the country. And I think that this contributed to the isolation that Russian communities felt in this very hostile, very cold landscape. Rasputin would certainly have uh, felt uh, part of that very cold, very isolated, kind, kind of embattled sort of Russian frontier, if you like, a sort of uh, Wild West, except of course the Wild East. Rasputin's origin in the town of Pokrovsky undoubtedly played a very large part in the shaping of his character. Not only is it the very fringes of civilization where pagan shadows hang over everybody's lives, irrespective of the presence of official Christianity, it's also crushingly dull. So the young Rasputin, being as he was, a letter and drinker, would have felt a very strong desire to, to be more than this, to break forth, to, to, to see something else. As a child, Rasputin began turning heads. His parents became disturbed by his constant visions of divine forces and by his ability to heal horses just by touching them. This was a time and a place that accepted magic and healing as a way of life. But many villagers were frightened of the child, convinced he had the devil in him. From fairly early on, I think he had a kind of reputation of peculiar person in his village. He certainly did have peculiar healing powers. He also um, just obviously had this ability to foresee the future, in, which stayed with him all his life. He'd just get sudden glimpses, I think, of things he absolutely knew to be true. By the age of 30, he'd married a local woman and had four children, but he'd also earned a reputation in the village as a drunken thief. He was accused of horse stealing and fled to the nearest monastery to lie low. His experience there was to change him forever. He spent several days at the monastery and uh, suddenly realized, you know, that he was basically a monk by temperament. In the monastery, his first contact with that ritualized form of religion, it must have been the opening of a door into a new world for him. And to Rasputin, that must have represented a dazzling promise, something he absolutely had to know more about, to get more involved with. Not only would it offer him the chance to entrench his own rather dissolute life in something deeper, it also opened the way to discovering new depths to reality. 
Rasputin stayed at the monastery for months and made friends with a man called Makari, a famous wandering holy man who had advised Tsar Nicholas II and Empress Alexandra. For centuries, Russian rulers had believed that holy fools had access to God and could give divine advice to the Tsar. Rasputin decided immediately to follow in Makari's footsteps. He does up and leave his wife and, uh, and go wandering as a, a staryets, a, a wanderer. He sees the opportunity to go and explore religion, to explore spirituality as his way of coping with that isolation. By traveling, moving on, so that everything around you is transient, you become closer to that which is eternal. He would go on long walks, long pilgrimages between places, suffer the assaults of mosquitoes in marshy swamps, stand motionless for hours on end. For months, Rasputin didn't wash, change his clothes, or touch his body with his hands, sometimes wearing iron shackles to increase the hardship. He certainly wandered way south to Greece, to Mount Athos, and he certainly went to Kazan in these wanderings, which lasted for two or three years. To begin with, you know, he was starved a lot of the time. Uh, secondly, the sheer physical hardship of walking around a place as big as Russia, where you couldn't thumb a lift, must also have been tremendous. But the result of all this was that by the time he went back home, everyone in the village felt that there'd been a basic change in him. People who met him were certainly deeply impressed because they felt that he's achieved some kind of peculiar religious essence in these years of wandering. They met him once and they were deeply fascinated and regarded him as definitely a holy man. Many in the village began to suspect that there were deeper, darker reasons for the change in the young Rasputin. There was talk that during his wanderings he had fallen in with the secret sect called the Klisti. The Klisti were outlaws. This is, I think, a very significant point, that they were, like all the sects, uh, the offshoots of the Russian Orthodox Church. They were an underground movement. They were on the run. They were a kind of anti-church. And I think that if Rasputin was going to go wandering in Siberia, he was definitely going to come up against them almost automatically. The Klisti had a very particular kind of worship that was nothing like the Orthodox Church. The Klisti gathered in crypts. Part of the service was dancing, and part of the service was fagellation. There were no priests, there were leaders who were laypersons. They would gather, they would sing, they would pray, and they would work themselves into a kind of frenzy, which they called radienia, or ecstasy. And in the process of doing that, they would begin to dance and whirl about and become almost drunk on spinning. They actually called it spiritual beer, this dancing, this whirling. They were not intoxicated on physical substance, but on the very Holy Spirit itself. They would prophesy, they would become possessed by this divine force, speak in tongues, that sort of strange ululation. They began strange feeling, like after narcotic, and more dancing, more feeling, dancing, non-stop dancing, and they felt that they changed. At that point where they had actually sort of built themselves into a fever pitch, they would then fall on the ground. Then what began was a kind of congregational orgy where everybody just engaged in copulation with whoever was next to them. And there was sex going on all over the place. Many sect of Christ used this dancing and non-stop rela uh, sex relations after. And um, it was very powerful sect. Uh, 
the Ian's very popular. These religious orgies were an essential part of the Cliste doctrine. They believed that by deliberately committing a carnal sin, they could repent more fervently and so get closer to God. They called it sinning to drive out sin, and it was an idea and a practice that Rasputin immediately seized hold of. For Rasputin, the idea of transcendence, the idea of all this energy flowing through the Ark was really seductive. These people were actually able to achieve peculiar mystical and religious states by going to these extremes. Now, I think that's what Rasputin had discovered. Extreme religious states that he was able to get into occasionally by going through what he felt to be sinful. Rasputin returned to Pokrovskaya and built a chapel in a pit beneath his house. He claimed to be a higher being, urged people to merge with him, and there were rumors that as part of a religious service, he would have sex with his congregation. He simply couldn't rest content with the levels that he'd come to. He had to be the source of the divine power. He'd seen visions all his life, but suddenly they became more intense. He appears to have seen a vision of the Virgin Mary, and she apparently told him to go to St. Petersburg. Um, where he would help the imperial family. While on his travels, he had impressed a number of aristocrats and clerics, and word had spread 1,600 miles to St. Petersburg of a strange, wandering holy man with powers of clairvoyance and healing. The city was the ultimate seat of power and home to Tsar Nicholas II and the Empress Alexandra, two of the most powerful rulers in the world. Rasputin believed it was his destiny to be a holy fool, like Makari, an advisor to the Tsar and Tsarina. At the age of 34, he began the long journey west. By 1903, word had reached St. Petersburg of a powerful mystic from Siberia with luminous wild eyes and a maniac stare. This was the home of Tsar Nicholas II and his wife, the Empress Alexandra. The stage was set for Rasputin's arrival. St. Petersburg was definitely a very peculiar city at the beginning of the 20th century. The whole place um, was absolutely feverish with a peculiar mysticism. It was a place of great sexual permissiveness, even by continental standards. The newspapers of the time were full of advertisements for treatments for venereal disease. The aristocratic circles of the time were crazy for all things occult. This was a time of seances, Ouija boards, all sorts of theosophic and occult thought. So when news began to circulate that there was a mystical type with healing powers, the doors were open to grand dukes and duchesses and to acquaintances of the Tsar himself. While traveling through Russia, Rasputin had secured a letter of introduction to the Tsar's father confessor. He became convinced that Rasputin was a clairvoyant and immediately introduced him to a fanatical monk called Iliador and a powerful bishop called Hermogen. Bishop Hermogen was one of the most widely loved and liked men um, in St. Petersburg. Uh, and he had a tremendous influence. Iliador was shocked by Rasputin's filthy appearance and pungent smell. But Hermogen saw this as evidence of his natural wisdom. His direct manner and ability to heal made Hermogen embrace him as a true holy man, referring to him simply as the saint. Aristocratic salons soon became both electrified and terrified by his presence, with everyone talking of the blazing gaze of his magnetic light-colored eyes. He turns up in the salons, in the palaces in St. Petersburg, I think his immediate attraction is that he's a curiosity. 
He's this rather bedraggled figure with a long beard that had remnants of food in it. People said he smelt like a goat. He didn't seem to have any respect for authority, so he would pick his nose and he would tell women that they were too ostentatious in their wealth. And yet, at the same time, he had hypnotic eyes. People said that he could dilate his um, eyes at will. All sorts of society ladies found a magnetic charm, even perhaps a sexual attraction, simply in his physical appearance. He was an individual of tremendous high dominance. Now, Rasputin was undoubtedly a king rat. King rats are the sort of person that women adore simply because um, they feel, you know, one, one glance from his eyes, one order snapped by him, and I shall turn to jelly. <laughs> While Rasputin entertained aristocrats, Tsar Nicholas and the Empress were holding regular seances with two Montenegrin princesses. Known as the Crows, they were fascinated by the occult and constantly supplied the royal couple with mystics they had met on their travels. Alexandra was a very, very superstitious woman and she had been through the mill with various kinds of mystics and um, holy men and so on, before Rasputin came on the scene. The big search for her was, of course, she wanted a son. She wanted to provide Russia with an heir. What you have to take into account, first of all, is that Alexandra herself was a silly bitch. Um, it's a great pity that um, she <laughs> married somebody who was almost as stupid as she was. Now, he just was not suitable to be a czar at all an intensely shy person. They just should not have been in charge of a great empire. Disastrous. When Alexandra finally gave birth to her son, Alexei, she was convinced it was the result of divine intervention brought about by the help of a mystic charlatan called Dr. Philippe. Before his death, Philippe had promised her that someone was coming who would take his place. She adored anyone that she felt, you know, was... Um, was some kind of holy man or healer. Um, she just went absolutely overboard. And this is what happened in the case of Rasputin. On November the 1st, 1905, the Crows finally introduced Rasputin to the royal couple at a private dinner. That night, the Tsar noted in his diary, we have made the acquaintance of a man of God named Grigori. They needed simple peasant types who they thought were more holy than cosmopolitan St. Petersburg people to buttress their regime. So they were automatically on the lookout for wanderers who had the touch of God, who might sanctify their power. And, of course, once the Tsarevich had been shown to be haemophiliac, they supposed that a holy man could cure him. After years of waiting for a son and heir, the Tsarevich, Alexei's fatal condition, was a personal tragedy for the royal couple and threatened the stability of the entire Russian dynasty. The illness was kept a state secret, but on a later visit to the palace, Rasputin boldly asked to see their son. What happened next was to secure Rasputin's position as one of the most important figures in Russian history. It was really quite a remarkable occasion. He asked if he could pray over their son. And at the same time, he seemed to know what was wrong with him. So you can imagine their reaction when this peasant from Siberia walks in and claims to know exactly what is wrong with their child. Alexei was in the middle of one of his crises. He'd been bleeding for some time from a knee injury. He knew that he could do this quite easily. He knew that he could cure. He'd done it so often. He would go deeper and deeper inside himself until suddenly he'd become totally oblivious of his surroundings. And it was in that state that he contacted some hidden strength, some hidden power inside him, and knew that he could actually cure. The next morning, he wakes up and is completely cured. 
proof in um, the minds of the royal couple of a miracle. Haemophilia was completely incurable. So anything or anybody that could cure that disease would instantly make that person amazingly powerful as far as the royal couple were concerned, and particularly as far as Alexandra was concerned. Rasputin would later tell them that without him, the child would die. Within months, he had free reign of the royal palace, visiting the royal couple uninvited and referring to the Tsar and Tsarina as Mama and Papa. We know from his own braggings that he had unlimited access to the daughters, and he meant access to be understood ambiguously. We know that he met the Empress on an almost weekly basis and could be summoned to her um, at all times of day and night. So he was an intimate, a confidant. He treated Zarina herself. Zarina was an incredible, nervous person. And Rasputin was the only man who was able to take off her headaches, who gave her opportunity to relax. It became known just how much influence he had at the royal court, that he had the ear of the Tsarina herself, and that a word from Rasputin in those ears could achieve just about anything that you desired. So currying favor with Rasputin was a pretty much direct route straight to the Tsar and Tsarina. Rasputin moved into this apartment in Gorokhovaya Street. People were soon queuing up to be near the strange holy peasant who was intimate with the Tsar and the Empress. This is his power base, really. He didn't just live here. And this is where he entertained numerous visitors. This is where the little ladies would come, his prostitutes, his female devotees from all levels of the social spectrum. He called them his fools, those who needed to be educated to see the spiritual light. It was here that Rasputin began developing his own religious doctrine, based on ideas and practices he had learned from the Khlisti in Siberia. He encouraged his fools to sin with him, so that their forgiveness afterwards would bring them closer to God, and there was no shortage of eager volunteers. They would have a strange ritual of eating and drinking when they were assembled for one of Rasputin's salons. They would all sit around with Rasputin in the center by the table with all the offerings upon it. It was uh, not part in Rasputin, uh, in Rasputin flat. It was a religious service. They sit in the chair and he was sitting center. And time to time, he began to speak something, and they immediately tried to write it. They tried to catch his words. They became sect. They did not understood it. They became typical sect. There would be seductions that these women would have passed through his special back room, where the first of the sexual advances would take place. I went to see Rasputin. He sat down across from me, placing my legs between his knees. Someone terrifying and ruthless was gazing at me from the depths of those eyes. Without sin, there is no life, because there is no repentance. And if there is no repentance, there is no joy. You want me to show you what sin is? He pulled me into the bedroom and tore off my dress as we went. The next moment, he was nothing but savage animal desire. The last thing I remember is his tearing off my underwear. Then I passed out. I woke up and found myself lying on the ground, torn and defiled. One disciple, Olga Lokhtina, 
became convinced that Rasputin was Christ and that she was the Holy Virgin. Abandoning her children and wealthy husband, she descended into madness and was seen holding Rasputin's penis while screaming, you are Christ and I am your you. He said she was a skunk who demanded sin. It was not sex, it was way to God. He took everything which was terrible in their souls. They became absolutely clean. They became like children. They like themselves in that moment because they were on the heaven. For them, it was absolutely normal. It was non-stop connection between sex, religion, miracles, and so on. But outside the apartment, Rasputin was making enemies. Senior politicians heard rumors that the new friend of the Empress was not to be trusted. Secret police were put on his tail, and their reports only fueled more rumors that the Empress Alexandra was confiding in a dark force. December the 1st. From the monastery, Rasputin went to Goncharna and took a prostitute to a hotel. Third December, he visited the offices of two religious newspapers after which he took a prostitute in December. After visiting Mrs. Golovin and her daughter, he took a prostitute. That evening, he went to the royal palace. The dark one walked around the streets, accosting women with vile suggestions. After visiting two prostitutes, he went to see the Golovins. The dark one left there around two o'clock and again hired a prostitute and went to the bathhouse with her. And it was in the privacy of the St. Petersburg bathhouses that Rasputin's new religious doctrine really took shape. A team of secret police officers had been appointed to keep watch on Rasputin day and night. Increasingly, he was seen entering bathhouses with both aristocrats and prostitutes. For Russian peasants, bathhouses were places of magic and superstition. Most Siberians were born in one, and there were places to conjure spirits, both good and evil. The bathhouses were places of carnal sin in the most deep and pure sense. These are wet, moist wombs, and here people come into contact with the spirituality of the flesh, the worship, the adoration of that which is carnal. This is one of the bathhouses where he would have come frequently. To Rasputin's mind, these were places where he would come to conduct a particular kind of holy service. You see, Rasputin had a peasant's mentality in many ways, and he dealt with the devil exactly as you'd deal with a Siberian wolf. He was hunting the devil down on the devil's own turf. Rasputin seems to have taken the devil into himself, waged that whole spiritual battle on the turf of his own body. He was calling the devil forth, taking the devil into his own flesh. He performed this ritual where he was trying to exorcise the demon of lechery. And in fact, beating the woman that he brought into the bathhouse with him, roaring at her, going on about the demon of lechery and how he was going to beat it out of her. Then, afterwards, they copulated. They fucked. He was convinced in himself that he was strong enough to carry out these 
unorthodox forms of worship. He was strong enough to take the Holy Spirit within him into the places where the devil, as he would have seen it, dwelled. These escalating battles with the devil soon started to take their toll. He was seen leaving the bathhouses, talking wildly with himself. It was conversation with devil on the street. Devil for him was a real person, and he had non-stop conversation with him. He's on this spiritual journey, and he thinks he can drive out sin by sinning. But in fact, the sin captures him, and he can't drive it out. He's angry with the demons that are inside of him that he can't actually get rid of. Those who have the power to work miracles are liable to suffer something which is called spiritual temptation, which basically means that your power source is suddenly switched so that you are performing miracles by the devil's power rather than God's. They're still miracles, they're just evil miracles. So when word got out that Rasputin was not only working miracles, but also living what was perceived to be a terribly debauched and dissolute lifestyle, the authorities of the church took action. Hermogen and Iliodor, key figures in securing Rasputin's access to the throne, lured Rasputin to a basement where they accused him of using the power of the devil to work his healing miracles. He was quite happy up until the point when they rounded on him and really laid into him quite viciously, telling him that he was in a state of spiritual temptation, that he had gone too far, that what he was doing was of the Antichrist. And Hermogen at one point grabbed him by the penis and said, this, this is what is leading you. They battered him with a crucifix. They literally, physically belaboured him with it. Deeply shocked, Rasputin reported the event to the Tsarina, saying that the two clerics had tried to kill him. Within a month, she banished them both from the city. But Ilya Dor was not to be silenced and fled to Finland disguised as a woman, plotting a way to kill what he saw as the devil incarnate. Rasputin went back to his own village of Pokrovsko on the 27th of June, 1914. The following day, at about 2.15 um, in the afternoon, the postman brought him a telegram. Rasputin wandered out um, to the post office to send a return telegram. At this time, a most peculiar-looking woman came up to him and Rasputin hand handed her some arms. And then suddenly she lunged at him with a knife and um, managed to get the knife more or less into his stomach. Zenia Gusyeva a deformed ex-prostitute with no nose had been sent by Iliador to kill Rasputin. Despite pulling his intestines out of his body, she failed to kill him. But his long stay in hospital was to have a huge impact on the fate of Europe. Just hours earlier, Archduke Franz Ferdinand was assassinated 2,000 miles away in Sarajevo, sending Europe spiraling into the worst war the world had yet seen. Rasputin was probably the only person who could have talked the Tsar out of mobilizing, but stranded in Siberia, he was helpless. There was nothing Rasputin could do about it by the time he got out of hospital and went to see the Tsar. He wrote to him from hospital saying, please, no war, no war. The Tsar didn't want to hear because declaring war had suddenly made him the most popular man in Russia, and he never had any popularity before that, not with the ordinary people. Now seeing these great cheering crowds wherever he went, he didn't want to hear what Rasputin had to tell him, but Rasputin proved to be perfectly right. The war, in fact, was the end of Russia. Rasputin wrote a letter to the Tsar. A terrible storm cloud hangs over Russia. Disaster, grief, murky darkness, and no light. A whole ocean of tears. There is no counting them, and so much blood. I can find no words to describe the horror. We will all drown in blood. The disaster is great, the misery infinite.
Rasputin returned to St. Petersburg more powerful than he'd ever been. The Empress summoned him to the palace and asked his advice on the war effort. Of course, when the war started and the Tsar went off to the front, then quite suddenly Rasputin, in a sense, became Tsar. With her husband away from home, Alexandra became increasingly dependent on Rasputin, becoming convinced that the safety of her family was entirely in his hands. He began regularly advising her on affairs of state and the war, advice that she duly passed on to Nicholas at the front. In the space of two years, Rasputin oversaw the appointment of four prime ministers, four war ministers, and six ministers of the interior. Rasputin was, in many ways, behind a desk. He was hiring and firing ministers. He not only moved in circles of power, he created circles of power according to who was on side and who wasn't. Nearly all Rasputin's interference in politics was a disaster. Nearly all of his nominees and so on were total idiots. Things just went from bad to worse with Rasputin as the man who was making the suggestions. The war was a disaster, the worst Russia had ever suffered, bringing the entire country to its knees. Four million Russians were killed, and St. Petersburg became awash with rumor, refugees, and mass demonstrations. The suicide rate tripled, the cost of bread quadrupled, bakeries were looted. The air was thick with talk of revolution. Just strike a tiny match, said one observer, and everything will go up in flames. By 1914, St. Petersburg was the capital of a nation at war. The poet Gippius called it a lunatic asylum, with the inmates of the city unable to tell the difference between what's real and what's false. But no one felt the madness more than Rasputin, whose personal battles with the devil were proving too much. His health began to break down, and that when his health began to break down, he ceased to have this healing ability that he'd had. He tried to heal some woman who'd come along to him with awful arthritis, and I sat there praying and praying and praying, and somehow nothing happened. He couldn't get down to that deep level inside himself where the power came from. And it was then that I think he began to feel that um, he, like everybody else, was due for extinction. Do you know that soon I shall die in terrible pain? God has sent me to be sacrificed, to save our dear, sovereign and holy Russia. Despite my terrible sins, I am a Christ in miniature. He wrote to the Empress prophesying his own murder. I wish to make known that if your relations bring about my death, then none of your family will remain alive for more than two years. They will all be killed by the Russian people. Tell your relatives that I have already paid for them with my blood. I shall be killed. I am no longer among the living. Pray and be strong. I think he was a deeply troubled spirit, as it were, that he really was wrestling with forces that he didn't feel that he could control. Rasputin visited his friend Filipov, sobbing after a drunken night with St. Petersburg gypsies. He'd squandered 2,000 rubles and had to visit the Empress that same day. Rasputin wept, declaring that he was no longer holy, but was a devil, a demon. Outside, the city had been rechristened Chetrograd, Devil Town, and the streets were buzzing with the rumor that Rasputin was a spy who shared the bed of the half-German empress. He had split the nation. To some, he was the voice of old Russia advising the throne. To others, he represented all that was wrong with the Tsar and the court. He was ignorant, corrupt, and far too powerful. Rasputin's real political significance is as a negative, as an image of the treason which was believed 
at a national level existed in the court. The problem that all people had with Rasputin was that he was basically bringing the autocracy down. They thought that they could still salvage the divine principle of autocracy, of Russian nationalism, which went with it, so long as they could get rid of this malevolent influence. Finally, a fanatical politician called Perushkevich made a sensational speech in the state parliament, naming Rasputin as a dark force. A rascal, a hoist, a dirty, illiterate peasant is playing with our churchmen. What that beast are they taking us into? I want to sacrifice myself and kill this vile creature. Evil comes from those dark forces, from the influences headed by Rasputin, the evil genius of Russia. The next day, he received a telephone call from a young aristocratic bisexual called Felix Yusupov. Felix Yusupov was one of the richest men in Russia, probably the richest, and immensely good-looking. Uh, he was a dandy and a well-known homosexual who had, it seems, had homosexual relations with Rasputin. Convinced that Rasputin had become the satanic power behind the throne, Yusupov and Perushkevich approached the Tsar's cousin, Pavlovich. Together, the three men hatched a plot to salvage the royal dynasty. Yusupov's account of how he killed the mad monk of Siberia has become the ultimate Rasputin legend. On the day of Rasputin's death, Yusupov had asked him to go around there at an odd time midnight to meet his wife, Irina, who was known as one of the most beautiful women in St. Petersburg. They waited until the secret police had stopped hanging around Rasputin's apartment, and then they went to pick Rasputin up in a car and they took him back to the Yusupov Palace. There he was taken down to a basement dining room, which had been laid out as if for a meal. And um, what's more, they tr tried to make it look as if a, a lot of people had been sitting around the table. They twisted up the napkins and poured a bit of tea into the teacups and all that kind of thing. And so Rasputin um, sat there quite contentedly. He was told that um, Irina was still upstairs with the remaining guests that as soon as they'd gone, they'd have a conversation. Rasputin sat there. They presented him with a plate containing lots and lots of cream cakes. And uh, they also presented him with wine. And Rasputin at first didn't um, touch either. Then finally, Rasputin got a bit bored with all this and proceeded to eat the cakes and to swig down the wine. Now, there was enough cyanide, both in the wine and the cakes, to kill most people. Two hours and a half, he continued to be still alive after he eat endless cakes with poison. According to Yusupov, the massive doses of poison had no effect. He started to believe that Rasputin was being protected by demonic forces. Panicking, he ran back upstairs, borrowed a revolver, and returned to confront him. You would expect Rasputin to do something violent then, or at least to plead for his life. He didn't either, apparently just stood there. Um, while Yusupov let off a shot at him and Rasputin sank to the carpet. They were upstairs celebrating the, the death of Rasputin. But Felix couldn't shake the idea that something might be wrong. He opened the door and saw the body which was on the floor. But when he began to see, he saw how one of Rasputin's eyes a little bit began to open. He was still alive. Back from the dead, Rasputin tried to throttle Yusupov who broke free, started screaming, and fled upstairs. The doctor who had supplied the cyanide fainted in terror. Then they went back downstairs, and to their horror, Rasputin wasn't there anymore. And then they found 
that he crawled up a flight of stairs out of the room of crawling across the courtyard in the snow. Out in the courtyard, Yusupov fired twice at point-blank range, but Rasputin kept going, shouting back that he was going to tell the Empress. Then the Tsar's cousin, Pavlovich, fired two more shots, hitting him squarely in the back and then the head. Yusupov ran over in hysterics and began bludgeoning the body with a metal kosh. The shot poisoned bloody but still not quite dead Rasputin is bundled up, stuffed into a car and driven many miles out in the ice and snow to a bridge on the outskirts of St. Petersburg. By five in the morning, the conspirators were stuffing Rasputin's body through a hole in the ice, hoping that the current would drag it out to sea. But two days later, a grotesque frozen corpse was pulled from the river. The superstitious of St. Petersburg flocked to the site, scooping up water that the dead man had lain in. An autopsy found water in his lungs, suggesting he was still alive when thrown into the river. Yusupov promptly wrote an account of his battle to kill the devil. They prefer to create legend about devil. They gave him cakes, they continued to be still alive. They shot him, they continue to be still alive and devil returned and tried to kill one of them, but they shot him. Five men shot the only, not mujik, not peasant, but devil. His body was buried, then dug up and burnt at a roadside, just as he'd predicted months earlier. His own death at the hands of the Tsar's relatives led to the complete annihilation of the royal family. Within 12 months of his murder, Nicholas, Alexandra, and all five children were gunned down in a Siberian cellar. Rasputin's friends were shot by firing squad. Civil war broke out, and the nation imploded. I think he was a holy man in the fullest sense of the word. All of these other things, the seductions and so on, can be explained as a part of his peculiar obsession with getting rid of sin through sin. For Russia, Rasputin continued to be full of fantastic hypnotic forces, who was really, in many moments of his life, he was Superman. He was a simple man who liked liquor, was a good lecher, and who um, liked the influence he had over people of a higher social status than himself. So he was an adventurer. No one can be sure whether Rasputin was simply a misunderstood peasant or a devil in the flesh. Whatever the truth, his image has become a modern icon of evil and darkness, Russia's own Holy Devil.